You're live with Get Connected. Mike Agarbo here with John Beeler. We have an awesome program today. Of course, it's always about tech and uh, a lot of tech to talk about. We're going to be talking about email scams, uh, specifically a lot of the COVID ones that are going right uh, around right now. We'll be uh, chatting with someone from the RCMP about what they look like and what you should do when you get them. And uh, big data in agriculture. In the coming years, there's not going to be enough food to feed the growing population of the planet. We're going to talk uh, with the folks uh, about uh, some HPE or Hewlett Packard Enterprise uh, uh, computers that are helping scientists model agriculture and farming to uh, get better crop yields, better distribution. It's really a fascinating discussion. And, uh, of course, uh, we uh, will be covering the tech news uh, right now. Uh, big thing for me this uh, week, John, I was kind of jealous about this. Down in the U.S., uh, Apple has uh, worked uh, agreements with a lot of the healthcare providers down there to provide uh, users with their health records on their iPhone. That's coming to Canada now. That's awesome. Unfortunately, it's only a few hospitals to start with. <laughs> yeah, all in Ontario, which is great. Yes, which is great. But uh, uh, you know, but it's a start, right? Yes. Uh, but this is a fascinating thing. So you'll be able to get uh, you know all the information from your doctor visits, your immunizations, uh, trips to the clinic, everything. I'm actually kind of surprised it's taken this long to get some of this stuff because I think we all sort of have this stuff sort of spread across different things and PDFs and forms and whatever kind of, I got nothing. <laughs> I have very limited amount of stuff, but yeah. you know, I had to get some vaccinations a little while ago, uh, a couple of years ago for some travel. I have that receipt, but it'd be nice to have that all listed digitally. So I don't have to go look for that piece of paper, which I have no idea where it is. So the hospitals in Canada to start a uh, women's college hospital in Toronto, Ontario, St. Joseph's healthcare, Hamilton, course in Hamilton, uh, Ontario, and Mackenzie Health uh, up in Richmond Hill, uh, just uh, north of uh, Toronto uh, in Ontario as well. So uh, excited that it's a start here, and uh, hopefully that'll be rolling out to uh, more uh, regions uh, in time. Speaking of Apple, I saw a really interesting uh, study from the Mayo Clinic down in the U.S. basically saying Apple Watch users uh, are, uh, I guess, a little uh, concerned about some of the readings they have on their Apple watches and coming into the hospitals? Well, I would much rather be overly cautious and notified of a potential problem uh, than not be notified enough about these problems. I think so. Uh, so this study was done uh, again uh, through the Mayo Clinic College of Medicine uh, back through 2018 and 2019. This was the time uh, when uh, the latest Apple Watch had a new feature that could detect irregular heartbeats. Yes. Or, uh, arterial Fibrillation? Yes, AFib. AFib. Uh, and so atrial fibrillation, sorry. And essentially, <laughs> people were coming into the emergency wards uh, because uh, the watch said, hey, your heartbeat's irregular. So uh, out of, uh, I think, about close to 250, 264, 264 patients uh, that, who said that their Apple Watch had given them this notification – only 30 in the end were diagnosed with the cardiac uh, issue. I, I, I've only had it triggered once. Yes. And we were at CES. <laughs> Down in Vegas. <laughs> which is never a good way to start the conversation. No. Um, but I had just chugged a Red Bull. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. And it said, hey, slow down. So not only does Red Bull, Red Bull give you wings, it gives you... <laughs> AFib. AFib. <laughs> That's great. But the thing is, is, like, you know, it's nice that my watch is notifying me of this stuff. Yeah. If it was continually notifying me of problem, then I would go see a doctor. But I, I knew I had just chugged a Red Bull and ran up some stairs. So yeah. I was doing uh, a lot. Yeah. But again, I, I know that uh, I think obviously doctors and healthcare practitioners think that's a bad thing. And I guess you don't want to waste medical resources. But at the same time, if my watch was saying that, hey, I think there's something wrong, I would probably... Want to get that checked out? Unless you're a doctor. Yeah. Unless, <laughs> unless you're a doctor. Like one of the new features I have in my new Apple Watch, you know, the the six, uh, Series 6 version is the blood oxygen sensor. Oh my God, I am glued to this thing now. <laughs> like, Does your blood oxygen ever drop below 100? Uh, yeah. Well, usually it's, uh, you know, up around 96, 98, 100% where it should be. But uh, 
I'm, I'm looking at night sometimes and I'm concerned I might have sleep apnea. Yeah. And so it's occasionally through the night because it takes automatic readings has dipped down to like 88 and now I'm freaked out. So you're, you're huffing oxygen. I'm <laughs> got an oxygen tank by my bed. I'm like meatloaf, you know, <laughs> in concert. Uh, so yeah. Am I going to get that checked out? Yes. Yes, I am. Wouldn't you? I, I don't even fully understand what block, but that blood oxygen measurement is telling you. It's telling me I don't have enough oxygen. <laughs> but is it and normal? From, you know, I'm not a scientist, uh, but uh, last time I checked, uh, oxygen is an important component of life for, for us. Okay. So anyway, doctor, I'm coming to see you. John, I know something has really excited you this week. Uh, Both you and I are into retro gaming. We have our own arcade cabinets that we've built. I actually think it's exciting you more than me. (laughs) It it is. So I've just built an arcade cabinet. It's in my garage because that's the only place my wife will let me have it. So I can play Pac-Man and Joust and Donkey Kong and Space Invaders. The one thing that I haven't been able to play really well are some of my favorites uh, like Tempest or Gyrus uh, or Warlords. And for that, you need one of the spinners. Yes. You remember the paddle controller for the old Atari uh, video game consoles, that that type of thing? Yes. Well, you've actually purchased one, like yes. a real arcade one. Yes. And if you're watching our video podcast, you can check this out. It's got a nice red top on it as well. And that's something that you're you're going to build into your... Um, your arcade cabinet into the joystick part. Yeah, I've got a tank stick, uh, as do you. Yeah, and which is kind of like the... Yeah, I mean, it's the easiest way joystick. to get everything you need in one... Control thing. Controller yeah. uh, that's actually legitimate arcade controls. The nice thing about this particular one that I got, I actually got it from a place in uh, Edmonton, uh, retroarcade.ca, I think. Yeah. And uh, the nice thing about this is that you just pop out an unused... Uh, uh, button. button. Yeah. On, and how many buttons are there for each player? There's, there's two there's, sets. On my our tank sticks, we have eight buttons per player. Yeah. And I never use more than two or three. Right. For the retro games, absolutely. It's more, more the newer games or the newer consoles that you would need more buttons. Yeah. Um, so it's really no, no loss. And worst case scenario, you can actually just drill another hole and drop this in. This drops in. It, it, it fits perfectly. It has a little... Um, little PCB at the end of the connector and you just plug it into your USB and it's treated on a computer like a mouse, but it only goes on the X axis. Got it. So, and uh, if you want to use two of them, you need to be using a PC. I'm using a retro or um, a Raspberry Pi, so I can only use one spinner on my setup, but you're using a PC. So, oh my God, I'm going to town. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so the, the beauty of this is that it gets weighted too. There's a little fly weight that you attach to the bottom. You can get them in different sizes depending on how realistic you want the spin to be. And I have to say, like, the first thing I tested it on was the Atari. Uh, one of my favorite games on the Atari 2600 was Kaboom. Kaboom. Yeah. Oh, and my it, God. And I, it, that's the best. And it works so well with that. Um, then I tried it with Warlords just to rub it in and sent you a screenshot. Yeah, I hate you. <laughs> and uh, I've tried it with a few other games, too. And it's just, it's so good. Probably the best game for it, though, uh, is Tron. Oh, I remember Tron. Because Tron, yeah. if you remember, you actually had like a, like a flight stick with a trigger. Yes. And then you had a spinner. Yeah. So you'd actually be moving and shooting with with one hand and then spinning to control the gun placement yeah. uh, with the other, uh, with the spinner. And the placement I found on the tank stick, it allows you to sort of have your fire button because I, I don't have the, you know, the trigger control. Yeah. Um, and use your thumb to control the spinner. So you actually get, it's so much more accurate. I got like one of my highest scores ever uh, on the tank stick uh, the other day when I was playing with it. How much was it? It was not cheap. Uh, delivered in Canada is about 140 bucks. Oh my God, for a little thing that spins. <laughs> yeah, it's basically, it's almost like half a mouse. Yeah. But I mean, you, you, you've seen it. It's all metal construction. It's weighted. It's It feels actually feels better than some of the arcade ones that we played in the arcade. Yeah. Uh, it's really well built. Um, this particular one's called the spin track by a company called Ultimark, which you can get in the UK, uh, directly. I opted to go through, um, uh, the Edmonton store cause a, I could, I got it literally in a couple of days. Um, and it was about the same price and I didn't have to deal with, uh, customs. 
Speaking of uh, gaming, I don't know, one one company I follow, it's called Arcade One Up. They make these little mini arcade cabinets. You can get them at like London Drugs and a bunch of other stores. Um, and typically they've just got a few games in them, like yeah. maybe Pac-Man, Miss Pac-Man. Another one will have, you know, the Street Fighter games and what have you. Uh, they're coming out with a new thing called the Infinity Game Table. If you get a chance, Google that. Uh, again, from Arcade One Up. And uh, this is something, it's not out yet, but they're coming out with it. And essentially it's... It's like a little coffee table that has a screen on it and it's got, you know, dozens of your favorite table or board games built into it. So things like Scrabble, Monopoly, Trivial Pursuit, Yahtzee, uh, you know, all sorts of different puzzle games. So they've got two models, a 24 inch and a 32 inch. So it's like a little mini coffee table, or you can take the legs off and just put it like flat on your kitchen table or any table that you you have. And, you know, you can play four people at a time on this. That looks pretty cool. Yeah. I, I just came across it last night. And do you think I want one? Yeah. <laughs> it, I mean, it's so awesome. I mean, that would just bring game night back that, you know, everyone could play. Like not everyone likes playing video games, but yeah, people like Monopoly and Scrabble and stuff. Yeah. Well, and those are also great for, I think, for tabletop games as well. Yeah. That, uh, you know, you need, where you need to keep track of something or I, I haven't seen the implementation yet. Uh, you know, if there's some other types of games that are on there that are animated or something like that, that you can play. I haven't got the price yet, but uh, we'll uh, keep on top of that. Okay. We're going to have to take a break. Uh, When we come back, still a lot more to talk about here on get connected, including the latest COVID email scams and what you need to know back after this. You are back with get connected. Mike and John here. Well, with COVID-19, all kinds of problems uh, around the world, economically, socially, politically. Well, another one is email scams. Apparently, uh, Canadians have been uh, scammed out of $1.2 million in regards to some of these scams that we know about. Uh, on the line, we've got a great guest. His name is Jeff Thompson. He's a senior RCMP intelligence analyst over at the Canadian Anti-Fraud Centre. Thanks for joining us, Jeff. Thanks for having me. Uh, I mean, email scams are nothing new. Obviously, they always try to take advantage of the uh, the latest uh, thing happening uh, out there. Uh, how are they getting people to part with their money this this time? Yeah, there's, there's a variety of email scams we see. Probably the most common one is uh, is phishing scams today. So we, we know that personal and financial information is a commodity today. Uh, criminals are looking to acquire as much personal information from you as possible so that they can apply for credit in your name and carry out other identity frauds. Um, so, so, I mean, phishing is the top reported one, one we see, uh, certainly there, you got to be on the lookout for emails that look like it might be coming from someone, you know, a trusted source, such as your, your bank or a government agency and asking you to click on links and, and provide a lot of personal information. Oftentimes these come with a sense of urgency saying, you know, we're updating our records or, uh, you know, there's been a breach. Uh, we need to update your personal information. Uh, so, so it's really being aware that, you know, uh, legitimate institutions aren't going to solicit or, or canvas you through email to, to get this personal and financial information. You know, sadly, I have fallen for some of these before. Uh, fortunately, it wasn't too too bad. I, one of it was like Twitter. I, I got an email from Twitter saying, hey, uh, you need to update your your username and, and password. And, I, you know, like an idiot, I just clicked the link and did it. I, I got one just the other day, actually, from Apple saying, hey, here's a receipt for that purchase for like a $300 app. Yes click here to cancel it <laughs> and then they want your password information and then you're uh, you're done yeah uh, but you know that that's the big thing uh, here Jeff that uh, people are actually losing a lot of money when they they fall for these what, what are some tips you could give uh, folks uh, out there when they come across some of these emails they, and like you said they they look very real yeah yeah I mean the the, the process has gotten quite sophisticated in being able to, to spoof uh, or mimic legitimate institution. So that email looks like it's coming from somebody, you know, somebody you trust. Um, so it, it, it is difficult to recognize, but you know, typically, you know, what I'll tell people is, you know, even though you're getting an email, you're signed up for email alerts from, we'll say that, you know, the can of revenue is a, a big one. We, we've seen a lot of phishing scams around. Um, so you get these email alerts from can of revenue agency. Don't click on those links. Not that there usually is any links from a can of revenue agency revenue agency email it's usually directing you to go to your my service canada account like visit the website and log in that way right um and it's the same with the ebay or the paypal ones you refer to you know if you have these accounts go direct to the source to log into those accounts don't follow a link in an email um so it's really questioning any and all emails that you get 
you know, making sure your spam filters in your email systems are, are set to high, right? Uh, you know, I'd like to think most email services today have pretty solid spam protection filters. Um, many of these emails or most of them do end up in junk email inboxes. So, I mean, you know, if you're, if you're opening emails in your junk inbox from sources you don't really recognize, that's, that's usually another key indicator, right? Is, is that the email lands in that junk inbox. Um, but, but again, it's, you know, as soon as they start asking for personal and financial information that, you know, there's a sense of urgency that you need to do this right away, that there's been a breach or, uh, whatever the, the scenario they might use, you know, it, it's the question that not provide or not click on any link or even in, any attachments in these emails is a key piece of advice. I was going to say a lot of times, uh, any of these places like the CRA or uh, your bank, they would actually have like an inbox and outbox in your account to show you any kind of messaging that they would actually be sending out. So you can actually kind of verify if this was a legitimate message or not in a lot of cases. That, that's correct. Again, it's going it's going to the actual source, right? Uh, again, go, you know, visit the, the CRA website, log into your account that way. And it's not following sort of these instructions in emails that are directing you to click on links or open attachments. So, Jeff, I have to ask this. Obviously, you know, we have a lot of personal responsibility to make sure that we're not clicking on these uh, these crazy uh, emails and, and, you know, giving out our personal information. Uh, you know, obviously, we have to be wary of that. Uh, but can the RCMP do anything about this? I mean, obviously, these things are coming, like, daily, if not hourly. Like, how do you keep track of them? And, and what do you guys do about it? Right. So, you know, from a, from a phishing perspective, um, a lot of times it, it involves disruption. So and what I mean by that, it's working with the service providers to get the emails that are email addresses that are sending out these emails shut down. Um, so to prevent further people from receiving them. Some people call this, a, a, you know, a bit of a game of whack-a-mole where, you're, you know, you're chasing, you know, for every email you shut down, there's a new one popping up. Uh, in a lot of cases, we know the, the processors are using, you know, botnets or computer technology to automate the, the sending of these emails. Um, but at the end of the day, that, that, you know, we're collecting them all. We're, we're collecting all the email addresses, the websites, the links that they're giving you. And, and we're working with the service providers to get these things shut down as fast as we can. Uh, we also work with a lot of the private sector partners, uh, you know, the banks or the government agencies that are being affected by these things to get the fraud prevention awareness messaging out there. Um, obviously, key to reducing fraud is fraud prevention awareness messaging, and it, it's really about educating the public. Um, so one of the key areas there we've talked about is, you know, tell two. Uh, it's, it's a great UK campaign that started where uh, if everybody told two people in Canada about a fraud that, you know, uh, an unbroken chain of 25 tell tours, you'd almost educate the whole Canadian population, right? Um, so, so it's, again, it's about recognizing, reporting and rejecting, um, you know, and, and talking to other people about it, right? You know, let's, let's reduce the sort of stigma behind fraud, uh, you know, the shame, the embarrassment that comes with people falling victim to fraud and really start talking about it and warning other people about the fraud. I, I was going to say, I think that's also a big problem is that we only know what's been reported. And if, you are a victim of fraud, you might be embarrassed and not even want to share that you've been a victim in that case. Yeah, I mean, that's we, we, we uh, conservatively estimate that we only get uh, 5% of the actual fraud reports that are out there uh, and, and various reasons for this. But the, by and large, you know, there was a University of McMaster study done in 2008 that showed, you know, 13% of victims of identity fraud report to police. And under 1% actually report to the anti-fraud center. So we can certainly say that it's 5% reporting that we get because we know reporting rates vary from scam to scam. Uh, and like you mentioned, there's the, the social, psychological, and emotional impact of fraud. It's not just a financial crime anymore. It's, it's you know, it's, it's destroying lives at the end of the day. Uh, and, and, I mean, there's cases of suicide attached to, say, romance scams, you know, where people have lost their whole life savings, their emotionally and psychologically ruined because, you know, they found out the, the person they were in love with and going to marry was a complete fraud, right? Um, so, so it goes beyond just financial losses. And again, it, 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 talking about it, getting the word out there, letting people know that they're not alone, it's happening, uh, to make sure we warn other people and, and reduce the fraud. How successful are you guys at actually catching the, the people that are, are doing this? So at the Anti Fraud Center, we don't investigate. Uh, at the end of the day, we're an operational support unit. Um, if I can explain it, sort of an idea is of central sourcing fraud data, right? So if you get a complaint, say out in Halifax, Halifax Police is, is investigating. Complaint out in Victoria, BC, Victoria Police is investigating, and, and, a, and a complaint in Toronto, where Toronto Police is investigating, and it's the same fraud. You potentially have three different police services investigating the same thing. 
So sort of our role here is to, to central source the data, deconflict with the different police services, and then compile um, the data to kind of point it in the right direction. You know, maybe it's the best place to investigate is Toronto, maybe it's the RCMP or whoever it might be. Uh, but to sort of provide that sort of intelligent-led approach to policing and and support the operations. Um, this being said, even though we don't investigate, we know that there's been, you know, if, if you go back to, uh, I want to say December, uh, it might have been November, you know, there was arrests over in India. Um, more recently in February, you saw the RCP make some arrests again in relation to the CRA telephone scam. Um, so, so people do get caught. It does take time. You know, a lot of times uh, with the fraud today, you're, you're looking at, multiple international jurisdictions so investigations you know you're dealing with laws in other countries collecting evidence and information uh, from other countries so you got to work around their laws and, and it's a slower process but but it does get done we're talking with jeff thompson he's the senior rcmp intelligence analyst with the canadian anti-fraud center thanks for joining us today jeff thanks for having me we come back from the break more tech to talk here on get connected stay tuned You are back with Get Connected, Mike and John here. Don't forget to hit our contest page at getconnectedmedia.com, giving away a Roku sound? Stream bar. Stream bar. Sorry, there's so many names for all these things. Stream bar. This is actually a cool little device. It's a sound bar and a smart TV uh, box built into one unit. And it doesn't take up like an entire shelf. It's like tiny. So this will fit into any condo or home and any size TV. If you want to enter to win... Get connectedmedia.com, hit our newsletter tab. I want to talk about uh, food scarcity now. You want to hear some scary numbers? Sure. Okay. Globally, nearly 800 million people are chronically undernourished, and these problems will only worsen as the world's population grows to 9.8 billion people by 2050. That's a lot of people. Uh, this will, rec- uh, will require us to produce as much as 70% more food by 2050. Well, how can technology help? Well, thank God we've got a good guest on the line. His name is Brian King. He is the coordinator of CGIAR. Uh, They have a platform for big data in agriculture. Thanks for joining us, Brian. I'm happy to be here. Uh, Just for my own personal knowledge, what does CGIAR stand for? (laughs) CGIAR, uh, we, we used to be called the Consultative Group for International Agricultural Research. And uh, that was a bit of a mouthful. So now we are CGIAR. Uh, those who know us call us the CG. CG. Okay, we're just going to go with the CG. Uh, yeah. So I wanted to get you on the line today because I, I think globally we are dealing with a huge problem. How can technology help us solve this, Brian? Well, there's um, at a bunch of uh, sort of several different layers to that to that question and to the interventions required. I think um, you know we've seen a lot of really great movement in the uh, what's called precision agriculture space, where you can bring uh, you know data and sensor technologies and drones and satellite imagery and integrate those in with farming technologies, other farming technologies like harvesters and variable rate application machines and so forth. Um, that's all amazing stuff, and it's you know kind of farm level, ground level um, intervention. I think what we, you know, particularly now in the in the in the in the COVID um, crisis, it's become really really clear that we need um, some greater kind of sector level intelligence about how do we coordinate all this stuff, and um, and so <clears throat> you know at a higher level we need need to be able to look at okay. Um, where is food flowing from and to, um, uh, uh, where are climatic, um, you know, kind of scenarios going to be playing out and how, um, and then how do we sort of put those things together, the, the real precise measurement and action at the farm level and the, um, you know, really timely kind of monitoring and prediction at the, at the sector level. So we're, we're not using an app on an iPhone to figure that stuff out. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's right. Yeah. So, 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 what kind of, so what kind of computing power do we need to, to make that happen? I mean, you know, some of the numbers I talked about earlier, we need 70% more food being uh, grown than we have today. Like that's, that's huge. Well, so we've got, you know, there's the, the space agencies um, are pushing out lots of really great public data, just imagery about what's going on with planet earth. 
And, um, and it gets really compute intensive to be able to take that great data and then dial in, okay, and look at, okay, what's happening with, you know, landscapes where food is produced? Um, how are those landscapes changing? How, what are the threats that could come under, you know, they could come to the, to the production side of, of, of food systems. And so, um, you know, I, I think the technical term for how much compute is a lot, <laughs> Um, you know, and, and, and so actually, you know, we were able to, to, uh, leverage some in-kind contributions from, uh, uh, other partners who have real significant supercomputing, um, abilities to start to show how do we do this in a really dynamic and large scale, um, way. Um, and so, I mean, every day there's a new picture of at least one, you know, um, global picture, actually several, um, from satellite. And um, it's this emerging discipline about how do we really apply this in to understand the world and then predict what's happening in the world so that we can then be intervening uh, um, in, you know, food and farming systems. So I understand you're working with companies like uh, HPE. Uh, they're obviously really big into uh, the latest in technology and servers. Uh, what, are, what are they bringing to the table? Um, so the the uh, memory the uh, computing uh, memory driven computing sandbox um, is a uh, an environment that they created where partners can go and get access to some really awesome supercomputing power, um, and specifically what what we've been doing with them is looking at um, you know a crop there basically there's a statistical method called a crop model where you can you know, take all of the inputs and then start predicting what the outputs of crops are going to be by location, by season, and so forth. And so one of the things we've been able to do with HPE is take these crop modeling approaches and implement them across multi-country scales and be able to, you know, increasingly monitor and predict what's happening with uh, crop productivity um, across multiple countries. And so, you know, whereas before you could run one of these on a reasonably powerful personal computer, but, you know, for a pretty, you know, limited geography, but now to be able to run in parallel those analyses over really large scales um, unlocks these really interesting capabilities to be, to be able to start looking at, okay, well, how's a, you know, how's corn gonna look this year in geography X? Um, uh, you know, what do we know about um, how that then might go interact with, um, you know, the rest of the food system in terms of distribution, uh, demand, and so forth. And so it's really the ability to run massively, you know, parallel analyses really quickly um, that unlocks all of these amazing new capabilities for food researchers, uh, food security researchers like uh, those at, at CG, at the CG. At the CG. So. How, how fast are we talking? I mean, you covered a lot of different things that it, it has to compute, so to speak. Like you talked about mm -hmm. corn, like where's the best place to grow it? Like how well will it grow in this area based on all the, the data that you currently have? Then you talked about distribution and uh, <clears throat> supply and demand. I mean, there's a lot of data coming in there. Like how fast are you getting back uh, the answers, so to speak? <laughs> With the, I mean, with the crop modeling work, a colleague um, uh, ran, you know, in a couple of hours um, for three countries, um, leveraging the, the HPE compute resources, which is something that would have been a weeks long uh, project. And, and when something takes weeks, then you lose some of the agility and responsiveness that we're looking to build because the shocks are coming at us, you know, kind of new shocks are coming all the time. And so what we're finding is, you know, the ability to run some of the analyses we would do anyway, but to get them back, you know, in hours or minutes even, um, it builds a new capability uh, for, for, for food security. Um, some, of, some additional work that we did with HPE was to look at, um, you may have seen in the press about uh, how, you know, the air over, um, you know, Wuhan and China, um, you know, something got way more clear or the air over cities that went into lockdown um, from COVID got way more clear. And um, that actually opened up a really great opportunity in terms of analysis to be able to say, okay, well, we know what it looks like. Now we can know, know what the signal is from space of emissions related, linked to economic activity. And so with HPE, we looked at scores of cities and we're moving out to several hundred now where we can basically, um, you know, we trained up the, uh, a model and a capability to be able to monitor um, 
you know, how is economic activity recovering in those places and how does it compare to economic activity um, pre and post COVID? And so again, these massively parallel computation to be able to get some speed and agility to be able to know what's going on and being able to intervene is kind of the, the big thing that's unlocked through this amount of computational power. If I'm trying to boil this all down now, what used to take a uh, week or weeks as far as running these models through a computer can literally just take hours now. So you know the best place, for example, to grow corn. Who Who is uh, driving this? Is it like led by countries or companies for this data? Like, And, and where is the data going to? We're, um, so we're a, we're public interest, public good organization. We're funded by governments, foundations. Um, we do some, some R and D collaborations with private sector as well. And so, um, you know, the uses of these kinds of analysis tend the first, the kind of first users tend to be policymakers who are trying to just have an accurate picture of what's going on. So then they, they, then they can know how to, you know, that can inform things like fiscal stimulus, that can inform things like um, uh, 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 food assistance or, um, you know, uh, emergency assistance, these kinds of things. Um, but progressively, this kind of analysis and, and insight into, um, you know, food production and consumption is the kind of thing that, you know, can go into then quantifying risk of um, you know crops by location by year, which is you know obviously really interesting to financial services institutions um, and others. And so it's like you know that big challenge of being able to measure what's going on with enough speed and agility to be able to inform what's going to be you know the appropriate response for for securing food. Um, you know can obviously has we're all stakeholders in that in in you know what what we learn from that. So. so this is more kind of from a macro level, isn't it? Like a farmer is not going to get this information about his specific crops or the best way to, to grow them. It does end up, I mean, a, a large swath of the research we do goes into ag agricultural advisory services. Um, several of our centers generate um, uh, what we call agroclimatic forecasts by season, by crop, by location. And so, you know, we can say to farmers, okay, this year looks like it's going to be a lot more variable in terms of rainfall. Um, you might want to consider X, Y, and Z practices or A, B, and C varieties this year for your location, for your crop. And so we do a ton of this work all over the world. And so, you know, the kind of analysis I'm talking about also goes into that. And, um, by and large, our, our, our um, you know, our, our sort of traditional partners and our, and our biggest, you know, type of partners are national governments and the, the advisory services and ministries of agriculture um, in those governments. We're talking uh, with our friend Brian King. He's a coordinator over at CGIAR's platform for big data in agriculture. And just talking about some of the technology that's needed to kind of model all the different data inputs to make sure that we have enough food for the uh, the world. Uh, they're using uh, something from HPE called Memory Driven Computing Sandbox that uh, takes all that data and basically is able to spit out answers in hours where it used to take uh, weeks. Uh, Brian, in your opinion, uh, if we didn't have this type of uh, uh, system and computing power, would we be able to solve this problem? I think what we really, uh, well, the short answer I think is no. Um, the longer answer is that we need agility and adaptability in our in our food systems. And um, you know, things as you know that um, you know we've seen in um, in North America where you know just food flows get disrupted from one day to the next because of unanticipated events. Those kinds of events are going to keep unfolding around the world, and so you know, agricultural development researchers like ourselves have not typically been geared up to be able to produce analyses in hours. You know, we produce analyses in weeks or more, and I think that we need that agility. Like as a as a global community, we need that agility, and to unlock that agility, we need compute power. Brian, thanks for joining us today. My pleasure. We'll have more information about uh, this uh, up on our website, and you can find out more info there as well about uh, the HP computer and solution they have that uh, helps make this all happen. We'll come back from the break. More tech to talk here on Get Connected. Stay tuned.
You are back with Get Connected. Want to give a shout out to our contest this week. It's an awesome prize. We're giving away a Roku stream bar. Roku is one of the biggest smart TV box manufacturers in the world. You can get their little sticks and boxes and make any TV smart. So you can watch things like Netflix and Amazon Prime, Disney, Apple TV+. Plus. Well, they've come out with a new product uh, that incorporates a sound bar. And I love it. It is so cool. Uh, typically, these sound bars are very large. They're very wide. Uh, this one here is about a quarter of the size. So it'll literally fit on any TV and still give you some really good sound. And they've also built the Roku Smart TV interface into it as well. So all you have to do is just hook one cable into the back of your TV. It's an HDMI cable. All the newer TVs in the past you know, eight years have got this, this port. And not only will you get Netflix and, and everything, but you'll get some great sound. And the sound is, is nice too because it actually helps uh, amplify the, uh, the, the voice like the speaking in TV shows and movies. I have a hard time sometimes hearing them now. And it also is supposed to normalize the audio for like commercials and things like that. Yeah, so. you know how the commercials get loud? Yeah. I hate that. Yeah. So it'll kind of tone that down. Anyway, we're giving one away. All you have to do to enter is go to our website, getconnectedmedia.com and hit our newsletter tab. We uh, have all the instructions there. Just follow them and you'll be entered to win in this contest and all the contests that we have going I, forward. I, I want to just add to that because we get a lot of questions about this. If you're already subscribed, you're entered. Yes. You can't unsubscribe and then resubscribe. That's not going to change anything. No, we know. Yeah, we can tell. Yeah. <laughs> um, so just if you're subscribed already, you're golden, you're entered. We'll let you know if you won. Also, we've launched a, a new uh, video and audio podcast series called Get Connected at Work. It kind of, uh, well, not kind of, it does. It talks about technology in business and work. We've got all sorts of great shows uh, up on our website, again, at getconnectedmedia.com. Don't also forget to visit our YouTube channel and subscribe. Uh, the more subscribers we get, the more videos we can make because it uh, just helps us make a little bit of money. Yes. From YouTube. A one, bit. one day we'll be rich. One day. One day. I want to thank all the folks that helped put the show together. Of course, uh, John uh, and uh, Christina, uh, our producers, and uh, the rest of the folks, uh, Stephen, AJ, Graham, Nigel, probably forgetting someone, but uh, to the rest of the team, thanks. We'll see you again next time. Don't forget to like and subscribe to our YouTube page. And you know that little bell icon? Hit that and you'll be notified every time we post a new video. And comment. The more comments and the more likes and subscriptions we get, the more videos we can make.